All right, thank you everyone for um, joining us today. Today we will have a session uh, regarding uh, a really interesting tool that we can that we can have enabled with our um, Blackboard courses, which is um, uh, social reading and collaborative annotation with a tool called Perusal and that we can integrate with, um, with Blackboard. This session is recorded and um, we will send you out the uh, recording link after this um, session. Um, our agenda for, for, for today is that um, we'll um, spend some time uh, talking about social annotation um, and perusal itself. We're going to talk about copyright issues when we use that tool. Uh, we're going to see perusal in action in a political science course and in an architectural uh, theory course, and then we will end up with uh, uh, Q&A and wrap up. Uh, I was thinking about how to start the session for, for a while, um, and then I stumbled um, on a presentation where this um, uh, quote was um, shared. Uh, the quote is from um, Jennifer Howard, and it was published in the Chronicles of um, Higher Education, and it goes like this, online, a book can be a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions and conversations. Those interactions ultimately become part of the book too, a kind of um, amplified marginalia. And um, I would like us, all of us to, to, to think about this idea of a shared space, a shared online space. Um, it has been a while since we, um, since we met uh, with our students face-to-face -face in a physical uh, classroom. Uh, probably this um, virtual uh, space that, um, that goes around uh, sharing the ideas of a text can give us um, some uh, compensation. So when, we, um, when you share a reading piece with your students, um, that, that reading ma material could probably uh, be a virtual place where your students can actually meet on, the, uh, uh, on, on that material and provide them with a way to, to actually have a conversation over the, uh, the, uh, the uh, text. I'm joined today with, um, uh, with two professors and um, um, our li uh, librarian from the AUS library, um, please welcome Dr. Bethany Chalkley, Dr. John Montague, and Ms. Veronique Lucat. Um, Dr. Bethany will, um, will speak about her experience with um, uh, perusal in um, teaching a political science course. Dr. John will um, um, take us um, uh, into some information about using perusal with his um, arch architecture course. Uh, Ms. Veronique will, um, will take us about some, talk to us about some um, copyright um, issues we need to be aware of when we, when we upload material to perusal. But before I go and give them the, the uh, floor, I have a few things to, to, to say about, like I would like to introduce the, uh, the uh, tool and the philosophy behind and having a tool like this in your online course. And, and actually annotations um, is nothing new. Okay, we have seen annotations um, coming into um, uh, the, um, on the side of the text in, in uh, books. And um, people have always interacted with the book it, 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 it itself and uh, registered their thoughts on that white space. And that white space became a place where people will go to uh, uh, many times to retrieve information that they have left on the book. And um, that information sometimes becomes part of the book itself. If we take the book and give it to someone else, that someone else might also go ahead and add some notations as a reply to our notations, although that it's not a conversation when it was, like when it was done on a uh, physical book, but it's a converse, it's just self-conversation. It's a way to interact 
with the um, with the material. It's one of the assets of active learning. So that that's uh, alone. If your students comes and annotate on a box in in a uh, book, that's active learning. And that now is changing. Uh, we're taking that active learning into a social learning by um, giving our students a uh, place where they can have a conversation over a written piece of text. So what is perusal? Perusal is a social learning platform that will allow people to collaborate, um, adding annotations on a piece of text. So all the annotations will be available to everyone and everyone can see um, everyone else's an annotations and interact with them, reply to them, um, ask questions about um, uh, a specific uh, idea that came in the text, um, help each other out. So it's a platform and this can be up applied on ebooks, web pages, or even digital documents that you up uh, upload to, per to per perusal. And we know um, from research like uh, that um, 60 to 80% of students do not actually read for multiple reasons, but the highly cited reasons are they do not read because they don't see that it's necessary to, to, uh, to uh, read. Like I can go and um, succeed in that course without actually reading the material um, or their inability to go through the, the entire ma material. They probably need help uh, with the material itself. So they cannot read it or uh, not because they cannot read, but uh, if they start to read, they stumble uh, 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 upon like challenging ideas or uh, they need someone to, um, um, to help them with what they are, they, they are reading, or they are not motivated enough to uh, read, uh, probably because it doesn't count towards their grades. So how, how can we solve this? Perusal and other social annotation uh, tools provide a, um, a way around that, okay? So it, it, it provides that place for social interactions, uh, so students can actually interact with their classmates over text. Uh, and um, it will motivate the students because these interactions will count towards their grade. And Perusal will do that automatically. You can set up uh, rules on Perusal that will go and um, count the number of interactions and the quality of, of interactions and then send the um, the uh, performance indicator to um, to to the grade book of uh, Blackboard. So the platform itself is free to use. Per uh, Perusal as a platform is really free to use. Um, so if you are going to use your own ma material, it's it's free. If you are going to um, to point per Perusal to a web resource, still free. But Perusal also have a huge library of e of ebooks. If you decide to use an ebook uh, on per per Perusal, then Perusal will make money by making students pay for the ebook. Uh, Perusal also will will make money by providing a, an optional institutional license to institutions uh, where institutions can actually um, uh, do their own branding. So this session is not a workshop on how to use per, per, per Russell, but um, I'm gonna go um, once I give the floor to um, our panelists and, and uh, paste in the, um, um, in the chat, okay, um, these slides. And in the slides, you can see that we have a comp uh, comprehensive um, setup guide on how to set up Perusal with Blackboard. And the setup is really simple and straightforward. It's just that you need to provision your Blackboard course on Perusal, then create a reading assignment on Perusal, and then link that reading assignment that you created on, on, uh, on Perusal with, with Blackboard. There are specific steps that you'll need to take, okay? And the steps are, um, are actually in the guide. 
when you're doing this, uh, the guides will ask you to provide keys. Like uh, these are like secret keys that you will get from Perusal. You don't have to do that. The system is configured um, system wide and the keys are already there for everyone. So you don't have to provide keys. You will not be asked to, to, to provide keys. So this is everything I need to, um, to, to say for, for today. And then I will give the uh, floor um, to um, Veronique uh, to tell us more about um, um, copyright issues when we, um, when we use per, per, per Russell. I'll step down right now and the floor is yours, Veronique. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walid. I'm just gonna share my screen. Just let me know if you see my slide. Absolutely, go ahead, okay. thank you. Perfect. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Veronique Lacat, and I'm a cataloging and metadata librarian, and I'm also part of the AUS Library copyright team. And I'm very happy to talk to you about copyright considerations when it comes to perusal. So with perusal, um, you'll be interested in posting all kinds of material on there. It might be a chapter or an article that you've gotten from the AUS library collection. Uh, it might be a scanned excerpt or scanned chapter from a print resource, a print book that we have in the library or from your own personal collection. Um, perhaps it's something that we've acquired through interlibrary loan. Um, or it might be a reading that you got from the internet. Um, so these are all things that we're, we want to put on perusal, but the thing that you need to know first is that you need to ask copyright at aus.edu um, before you post something. Now, the exception to that would be, as Willie mentioned, posting things that you yourself created. For example, uh, some professors like to post their syllabus. Of course, you can post that on perusal, no problem. But if it's things you don't own the copyright to, you just need to ask us first. Um, what we do is we can check the copyright permissions on your behalf. And just keep in mind that just because we own a book or article or, be, or something is free online does not necessarily mean that you can post a copy on perusal, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> um, we've looked at some of our e-resource licenses, for example, we have a lot of ProQuest eBook Central books, um, you know, JSTOR articles, and a lot of these licenses that the library uh, subscribes to, the licenses specify that you can link to the resources, but you can't repost them, not without purchasing a separate copyright permission. So please just keep that in mind. Um, what I want to do is take you through a few examples, real life examples of uh, permissions we've given um, to show you how this all works. So some real life examples. So example number one is a professor who wanted to post an old journal article that was something that was not owned by the AUS library. So what he did is he, he contacted us and we were able to get a PDF scan of that chapter by using our interlibrary loan service. So no problem there. Once we had the PDF scan, we would add a little footer to the PDF that said, this is only for use in Dr. So-and-so's class for this semester. Um, and we purchased the copyrights for the article and each student had to pay 23 dirhams um, to cover those copyright costs. So that's one pathway. Example number two, uh, we had a professor who wanted to post a chapter from a print book that was in uh, the, the AUS library collection. So of course she emailed the AUS library copyright team and we scanned that chapter for her and we purchased the copyrights and each student was charged in this case 75 dirhams to cover those costs. We had another professor who wanted to post a few journal articles and she notified the AUS library copyright team. And in this case, we saw that these articles had Creative Commons licenses. So in this case, they could be freely shared. Those Creative Commons licenses said they are free to share and distribute. And Walid 
also mentioned um, open educational resources. So with OERs, they usually have a Creative Commons license. And so that, that would allow us to share them. Of course, with, with attribution. So always citing what the source is, who the author is. And to give you a last example, uh, we had another professor who wanted to post an entire book on perusal. And they checked the perusal catalog and I have the, the URL right there. So Walid had mentioned that, that they do provide books through perusal, but in this case, it wasn't on there. So what this professor did is emailed perusal for support and asked them about it. And they were actually able to add that book to their catalog. So keep in mind, just because something isn't in their catalog doesn't mean that's the end of the road. It's always worth asking. So the students were able to purchase that book from perusal directly for the same price as it was from any other source. So it was about 83 dirhams per, uh, per student uh, for a 180 day access. So the thought, the idea that I wanna leave you all with is before you post, um, please just ask the AUS copyright team at copyright at aus.edu. So that's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much, Veronique. Um, that's really valuable in, in information. Um, wanted to remind everyone that um, we will have a, um, a time at the end of this um, session for questions and answers. Uh, also, if you need that, uh, you have like really an urge to come to the microphone and ask a question to any of our panel panelists, um, the microphone has been uh, en enabled for all our attendees. Thank you very much. And now let's go um, uh, forward and then um, give the floor to Dr. Bethany. Um, Dr. Bethany, you have the floor and um, you go ahead and tell us you, about your experience with perusal. Thank you. I think your mic is um, not enabled. I think your mic is muted. You go ahead. Oh, no. <laughs> is that better? Yes, good, okay. And you can see my slides as well. Okay, great. Okay, so um, I, yeah, so I'll be talking about using perusal in political science classes. And I don't necessarily see myself as an expert in using perusal. This is only the second semester that I have been using it. Um, and obviously maybe more of you have more experience with this. I went towards using perusal, obviously because of online learning. Um, and I should say that Paul 201, just to kind of introduce the course, it is um, the basic kind of introduction to political science class that um, is also open to majors and non-majors. So it's a major required course, but it gets a, it gets a lot of different people, right? It gets people who are um, interested in politics, people who are just taking it for credit, right? So it's, it's a big course and it's taught um, at least three to five sections um, of it are taught by different people every semester. So my experience might be different to that of my colleagues. And you know, if any of, of them are listening, then I invite everyone to join the conversation. So I'll just be kind of sharing what my experience was. Um, so I was, I think, attracted to the idea of perusal because you know, I was yeah, I heard these like nice things like what Walid has been sharing. Um, like students, they will read better, they will understand. And, and we always want that, right? We struggle to get our students to read. And so what we tend to do in these kind of sophomore 200 level classes is have these weekly quizzes, right? That kind of check in if students are keeping up with the material. Um, but because it's a political science class, we also really want them to discuss, right? We want them to talk to each other um, more. And, and so we, I was like, okay, great. You know, they will read, they will understand, they will talk to each other. That's great. Online learning also um, makes that hard, right? I remember just thinking like sitting there in the silence, looking at black screens, like the first week of, of, uh, of teaching online and being like, this, something has to change, right? We have to find some, some way to get kids talking again, talking to us, talking in lectures, talking out of lectures. So again, that, that was really attractive to me. Um, other people had said, well, you know, they're students, so they're going to 
feel at home in a space that functions like social media. That's their native environment. They will be, you know, they will be very at home in that space. And it's like, well, that, that seems good. Um, but it, it also kind of uh, had kind of in talking with my colleagues, it was like, well, maybe, you know, it will be a bit less work for instructors, right? Maybe instructors won't have to worry so much about creating and grading these weekly quizzes. And also very importantly, maybe they, they won't have to worry so much about cheating on the quizzes, right? Because that became a big concern. Immediately we went online and it's like, well, how do we know they're not all, right, um, having their books out during the quiz? Or how do we know they're not texting each other the answers, blah, 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 right? And so you begin to worry that um, the scores perhaps are are overly inflated or they're not, they're not capturing knowledge in a meaningful way, right? They're not a meaningful assessment of learning. So lots of reasons to think that this is a good idea. Uh, so what, what did I do? Well, um, I think everyone kind of integrates perusal a little bit differently, but I think that the standard way that at least we've done it in 201 is to fit it in as, as like a quiz grade, right? Um, and that means replacing quiz grades um, with these active reading assignments and perusal. And again, we did that due to concerns about cheating, but also because online learning is hard and that kind of thing. So um, where we had a weekly quiz, we would just take a weekly perusal assignment from the textbook. So it was a, it was a kind of a one, a one-to-one -one switch out, right? And so that's the model that I followed in um, the fall of 2020. Now this year in the spring, I've been doing a little bit of a different thing. I've been doing a hybrid model with, well, I guess I'm calling it a hybrid model where I'm doing um, half of my quizzes are online, like traditional iLearn quiz. Um, and then half of my quiz grades come from iLearn readings. So again, I have done one semester of no quizzes, only perusal. And right now I'm in the middle of one semester that is half quizzes and half perusal readings. So why would I do that? Um, why would I step back from no quizzes? Um, well, we'll see as we go along that I think that there are some uh, bumps in the road with perusal. Now I obviously still like it and there's different experiences, but there were a few concerns that kind of came up in its implementation. And so I was, I was kind of curious to see what would happen if we went back a little bit, walked it back a little bit in the syllabus and did half, half perusal readings and half quizzes. And one of the big things there was that in last fall, when we came to the midterm assessment, the students really didn't know how to answer the questions because they had never answered a short answer question. And again, a lot of these students, maybe they're coming from engineering or they're coming from uh, hard sciences. So, um, you know, this is kind of answering a political style, political science question is, is foreign for them. And so actually I found that the quizzes had a very important uh, socialization um, purpose, as it were, like this is this is the type of, of short answer question that you will be kind of seeing in your exam. And so they felt um, when there was no quizzes, they kind of had no idea what to expect. They were very insecure and actually their um, their performance, I think, um, especially on the midterm decreased in that semester, although it's hard to know what to attribute that to. Right. But it didn't it didn't go so well. So I thought, well, I like the perusal space. I want to keep it. But I also think maybe having a few quizzes is, is okay because they need to kind of be socialized into this is how you write a short answer question in order to prepare you to do well on the exam. Um, so that's an overview of how I've been implementing perusal. Um, again, this is kind of what my syllabus looks like, just so you know, you don't have to read all of this. Um, but I'm in like, I'm, I'm like, a I do a lot of quizzes. So 10 quizzes overall and five will come from perusal, five will come from, you know, a quiz, but they will all have equal weight, right? And then I'll drop the lowest two um, and take the highest eight and that will be the quiz average for the course. Um, and so that's all kind of explained there in that, in that text. Um, so I think the next big kind of question or thing that I ha have still kind of had to grapple with is how, how do we grade, right? And I, 
I think there's some real, I look forward to the discussion because I know people have different ways of doing this. When you go into perusal, you have a choice between, do you wanna do this holistic grading versus the annotation only, right? Annotation content only. So if you do the holistic grading, then it's going to grade their interactions with each other. So their upvotes and their, um, their reading, the time they've been reading and all of this, or do you want to only grade the, the things that they annotate? So I kind of went back and forth on that. There's a, a second choice that you have, and that's between, do you want to grade it as an incomplete versus complete, which is just check you did it or check you didn't do it, or do you want to um, grade it based on a sliding scale? So do you want to make it, um, you know, in my course, I do a zero to five point scale, right? And then the, the last big kind of question is, well, how many annotations or how much engagement do you want to, to have? And I mean, I think I'm not sure that I've gotten all of these things right. Um, I settled on something that I think works for my course, right? But I can definitely see other courses going differently. Um, so I opted for an annotation only content. And here I'm kind of bucking the perusal recommendation. The reason for that um, is simply that I want them to learn how to express a written opinion, right? I, I want the, the focus to be on, can you express yourself in writing? Because ultimately that's where the, um, the points are gonna come from in the exam. So let's get, let's get practice on ex expressing yourself in writing. Um, and I also found that that was a much more transparent way of grading. Like the students got really anxious. Um, they were like, but I don't know how it's being graded, right? I don't know if I'm clicking enough buttons. I don't know if I'm clicking enough upvotes. And so what you might get uh, in the beginning was them just clicking everything, right? Just upvoting all the things <laughs> and then like, whoa, you know, that's obviously um, it, it's good that they're enthusiastic, but I don't know what that means, right? It's a, it's not a meaningful upvote because they're just trying to increase their score, right? They're, they're gaming it a little bit because they're smart. So um, let's, you know, I decided to focus on annotations because that gives me higher grading transparency and I want to keep the bar high for written contributions. Um, I would say that I, I, I also picked a sliding scale for grading um, because I think that, you know, I don't think it works in every course. I think it works for this course because, because it's replacement with the quiz, right? And so it didn't seem fair to replace a quiz grade with a, a yes or no type thing. So I kept the sliding scale. Um, and I, I decided on five annotations. You could do more, you could do less. Um, five annotations seems to work okay for what we have. And the end result of that is I think that student interaction is still quite strong. Like they don't stop interacting with each other just because that interaction is not being graded. Like they do still upvote each other, right? They do still ask each other questions. They are still having a healthy conversation um, on in that space. So I don't think that just by grading the annotations, I've lost the aspect of student interaction. But I think what it has done, which is more work for me, is that it, it means that sometimes the annotations are quite long because the students are, this is where their points are coming from. So they're like trying very hard, right, to, to, to gain those points. Um, so, so that is more work for me as, a, as, a, um, as an instructor and actually more work for them in reading each other's annotations. I think there could be uh, a little bit of uh, carrying on a bit. So anyway, this is a- You have five minutes, I'm sorry. Okay, sure, thank you. So this is a screenshot of how things have been set up, right? Just so you know, um, and, and if that makes sense, this is how we're, we're, we're doing it, right? Annotation content scores, five annotations to grade. And I do follow the zero, one, two grading for each of the annotations. Um, okay, so then the other thing that I really kind of thought about or struggled with is then what is the role of the instructor? Like how active should I be in the discussion? Um, and what I kind of settled on was this is their space, but I need to show them how to use it. So that meant that at first I was quite active, like the first couple of weeks I would post things and, um, you know, post some annotations and answer questions a lot more actively. Just, again, showing them how the tool works and how they can use it. And then once they kind of 
go and do it on themselves, I shift my role to being more of a referee and an expert, which for me, that means monitoring and course correcting as necessary. Um, again, the monitoring is just, I look at things that get upvoted because um, sometimes they're really good and really insightful things that my students have said. Sometimes they're false or <laughs> they're, um, you know, they're students, they miss it, right? <laughs> and so, so I think I, I look to see if the things that are getting upvoted are actually true and factual. Um, I also monitor the type of questions that are asked and um, the adequacy of student responses. So if someone asks a question and then it's answered, I try to look and see, well, did it get answered adequately? And if it hasn't, then let's let's come back and course correct that. Let me jump in and, and, and answer the question if it's still kind of pending. Um, Something that I faced as a political science instructor is that I've needed to continually remind my students that they um, can engage in, dis in respectful disagreement as well as have freedom of expression. Um, so what does that mean? Well, we, we tend to talk about a lot of subjects. Some of them might be considered sensitive. Um, and when it's online in this type of setting, sometimes students get nervous about expressing their opinions, right? Um, is it really, can I really say that? I'm like, well, are you being respectful in the way you disagree with your colleague? And if that's the case, then, then yes, right? But I think they're moving online, we really face the challenge of, you know, if it was a classroom, we felt safe, right? Because we're just here, we're just having classroom discussion, but actually posting something online for the whole class to see, I think involved a little bit more uh, encouragement, right? And so here, again, I know I need to move quickly, but yeah, here's a nice example of a, a discussion actually of religion and society and the role of religion and politics. And you can see that two, two students are um, respectfully disagreeing with each other about some you know, things that might and, and otherwise be considered a little bit sensitive. Um, so anyway. Um, Moving on, active assessment. So the sooner the better, I think, what do I actually do to then assess? I think that was a challenge for me. How do I know if perusal is you know, accurately assessing? And I will just say, I don't really trust a perusal to score these annotations, at least for political science. I think many unsupported and unsightful opinions are given a two instead of a one because perusal isn't perfect like that, right? Um, and I think that academic integrity also remains a challenge. I've had students call each other out for copying and pasting from Wikipedia um, <laughs> and perusal didn't know, um, but the students knew, right? And I also know sometimes if it's, if it's a C student and all of a sudden they have this like high grammar and then I Google it, I'm like, no, dude, this is, no, you're getting a zero, right? Um, <laughs> so, you know, that means that I have to be on top of monitoring this kind of more than I think I had bargained for. And, and what that looks like for me is that I do a quick read through the conversations that are happening in the book, again, to note where the upvotes coming from, where are the questions coming from and are they being answered. But I do look more carefully through the contributions for each student, right? And I also check that grading distribution. I don't like, you know, perusal, I feel like wants to give everybody full marks all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, no, right, that, that, that cannot be actually what's going on. So after I've gone back and corrected the marks, I usually find that, that it's less than half of the people that are getting full marks. It's usually somewhere between a third and a quarter of people. Um, so here's an example of looking at that student view, which I think is very useful. Um, so evaluating what each student has done, because there you can kind of see a pattern of how their writing is. So if if one student, if one annotation is like copied, then it's easy to spot that it's the outlier. Um, but you can see that you can also kind of grade them down if what they're saying completely misses the point or is not. I'm like, that's not even what that thing means, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, it does happen. Um, so how do we know? I think you yeah. have to wrap up now. Yeah. Thank okay. You. So uh, anyway, how do we know? How do we assess whether it's worked? Well, um, we have some qualitative reviews from students. Those might be, you know, that it's good, that it does give open instruction. Others say that it's actually a challenge because it's more reading and writing for second language students. Uh, they don't really like buying the textbook from perusal. They would rather buy it, um, get it from a friend or something like that. We also have some limited quantitative evidence that I'm kind of thinking through 
Um, we know that compared to average quizzes, perusal tends to give higher scores. And in the future, we hope to compare the exam scores for um, fully hybrid semesters versus the full perusal semester. So we're, we're trying to sort out whether or not it's, it's doing its job. But anyway, so we'll end there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, and um, would like again to, um, to remind everyone that we'll have some time at the end of this uh, session for coming up to the microphone. And let me know if you would like also to have uh, to, to be able to come to the, um, to the uh, camera. So we'll uh, give the floor now to, um, uh, to Dr. Joan. Dr. Joan um, uh, teaches um, arch uh, architecture in the uh, College of uh, uh, Design, Architecture and um, Art. The floor is your professor. And probably your uh, microphone is uh, muted. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, super. Okay. Can you hear me now, uh, Walid? Yeah, everybody. Yeah, great. Um, uh, that, that was great. And I really appreciated uh, Veronique uh, and Walid gave me great support at the beginning of the semester trying to work all of this out. Uh, this was last semester I taught uh, uh, an architectural theory course uh, using perusal for the first time. Uh, Dean Varkey was the one who kind of put it uh, my way and suggested that I do that. Um, I'm also using it again in a cities and cinema course. Uh, but I guess I haven't monitored that as closely, or at least the jury isn't in for me about how that may or may not have worked. Um, okay, so just going to give you a brief kind of introduction to the nature of the course, the nature of the students, and why I wanted to do it. I, I mean, I've learned a huge amount already from Bethany, and I think Bethany's monitoring of the, um, of the actual discourse is far more scrupulous than mine was, and I'll explain why. Mine wasn't, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm, I think I've learned quite a bit from listening to Bethany on that. Uh, my students are design students for the most part, uh, or exclusively architecture for this course, they're all architecture design students. Nevertheless, they take quite a few, obviously they take gen ed courses, but they take up to seven history and theory courses over their five year career, which is you know, quite substantial. Um, but anything that you do with the design uh, students is in competition with studio. So you're kind of prizing them away from design uh, and trying to get them to read. Now, in lots of ways, this is a 400 level course. Uh, the students have already written quite a few essays for me and for others of my colleagues. Um, my difficulty always with this course, and this is my seventh year teaching it, is, is getting them to read, you know, uh, uh, getting them to read difficult texts. Uh, the texts are architectural theory. Theory itself is a, is a strange uh, uh, word that's kind of halfway between, it's like a kind of philosophy or an argument for a practice. Uh, and typically theory questions are about issues of form and function, context and region. Uh, gender and architecture is important. Women in the profession is something else that we deal with. Sustainability and that. However, most of the, the, the readings are, can be, you know, fairly obtuse, um, uh, written often by architects rather than writers, and without the kind of uh, academic apparatus that we would expect in the kind of reading that we would give to our students. In other words, often they'll make references uh, to things that they'll never explain, partly because um, it's kind of, uh, kind of cool to do so, maybe for an architect to speak in an obscure language. Um, sometimes this language is kind of historically situ situated. For those of us who you know, grew up in the 1970s and the 1980s, it's hard for us to remember that the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s were, is history. Um, and so often the students react to these uh, texts in a way that uh, doesn't give kind of cognizance to uh, the times that they were written in. But nevertheless, just to go back to a point uh, that Bethany uh, raised. My motivation for this, for perusal, is to get them to read. It's much less about um, uh, testing a particular knowledge. It's about that intellectual engagement, uh, because that's the nature of the course. They do uh, long essays and they'll do presentations, but it's the pre and and the and the class is a a discussion class. Uh, and so I need them to be primed, like we all do for a seminar class, by having actually done the reading before. Now, uh, over the years, I've tried multiple different means to do that, including drop quizzes. 
again, not so much to test the knowledge, but just to test, did you do the reading uh, the night before? I've had them do reading reports. Uh, I've used the disc discussion boards and I even got them to do blogs, which was, you know, I had mixed success uh, with. Uh, but the perusal uh, for me is probably the most successful thing I've done to get them to read uh, so far. Uh, one of the other things that I've played with over the years is the shorter, shorter expurgated reading vers versus, you know, a full theoretical text. I mean, like a 14 or 15 page uh, learned article. Um, I've This year, perusal has kind of allowed me to mix that up to a certain extent. Uh, I have two classes a week, so it's two readings per week. And so I, I will often make it, not exclusively, but often make it short and long, one short reading and one long reading. Uh, depending on, on what's there. Uh, and that has worked a bit better for me, whereas I had been tending towards shorter readings in years uh, before. I just want to uh, uh, just pause for a moment on the whole idea of the difficulty of reading itself. Um, this is something that we're never really taught to, to do, uh, reading comprehension. Maybe, maybe in the English classes they are. Uh, we learn how to read, uh, but it's something that I'm very kind of self-conscious about myself. And I'm, I'm, I'm always intrigued about my own reading uh, approach. Um, and what is it that makes me lose attention? That moment when you're kind of realized that you've been reading three or four sentences, but you haven't, uh, you've lost interest or you've lost comprehension. And I think so often that's because there's some word or some phrase or some reference to something that you don't know about. Uh, and then, and, and you don't consciously recognize that at the time. And I kind of often kind of urging my students to kind of capture that moment uh, and to kind of mark it out for themselves, that moment when they get lost. What is it that they don't know? What is it that they don't understand? Um, uh, and so uh, one of the things that I think is great, I, th I think perusal is a, is a genuine paradigm shift. I think the idea of a reading as a group activity is a real radical change. Um, it's reading is, is a solitary thing and of course that's what makes it noble and brilliant and, uh, and on all of us who have built our careers on reading uh, you know uh, we we'll romanticize it to a certain extent but, but reading is a very difficult thing to do uh, and to do that as a group you know really shifts uh, the ground and has allowed you know real opportunities and I think uh, the social aspect of it uh, has really helped. Now in terms of uh, feedback you know, I kind of informally spoke to the students last semester quite a lot about how they, whether or not they were enjoying the experience. And broadly speaking, you know, the beginning and towards the end, they, you know, they always said, oh, no, no, it was a really positive experience. However, you know, there's always that uh, optimum, how much reading do you give them? And of course, when we get to the last three or four weeks uh, in the studio projects, really hype up and it's very difficult to get them to do anything uh, for you at all. Um, the, the evaluations tend to be you know, those who commented on them, five out of 31 students, had two sections uh, of 16 students each and one student dropped out. Um, uh, five of those commented on them, they were all very positive comments. Um, and I think that they liked it. Uh, uh, one one quite point I think is that I had fourth year students and the fourth year students tended to know each other very well. So they've already built up a sense of community and that kind of the kind of the manners, uh, as Bethany spoke to, and I think Bethany, you're absolutely right that monitoring that, particularly, you know, in loaded type uh, content like politics or, and all of this gets fed into our discourse in, in architecture, politics, religion, gender, um, you know, you're probably wise to, to, to closely look at it. But the, this group have built up, they know each other. Um, and I think that really helped uh, that sense of community uh, and there was an openness of, of, of conversation. So I was helped by that. Um, I, I don't know yet. My film course is open to a broader range of students and I'll have to look at that uh, closer uh, in time. So what was the quality of the perusal discussions? Well, the first thing is um, gamified learning and gamified reading, I think, is it's something that I haven't um, really been involved with as an educator. Uh, I've had my own experience with um, one of those language apps. I can't think of the name of it, but I, I uh, you know, gamified learning is quite addictive. And this idea of just getting your two points. Um, and I, I, again, Bethany, you're right about the gamified part. My tendency is to let was to let the machine just get on with it. Uh, and, and, I, and I'll talk about the grading aspect in a moment. And to some extent, I kind of lost out by that, but the students didn't. Uh, the motivation to simply, you know, get the points meant that they actually 
tended to write good, you know, good discourse uh, and, and write quite a bit. Um, an easy win for a student is simply to uh, post a little bit of information about a word. I encourage them to, you know, do an OED, an Oxford English Dictionary for any words that they don't understand, not just the random dictionary, but the Oxford English Dictionary, because it gives them that etymology. Uh, if they don't know an architect or a building, that they throw it up. Images uh, are something that, that uh, our course is really, uh, you know, it's a very helpful thing to have. Uh, so they'll throw that stuff up. There is the danger of plagiarism uh, and the Wikipedia plagiarism as well. I, I'm actually delighted, Bethany, to hear that other students are calling out students on that. Uh, I, I hadn't witnessed that myself, but that's great. I, uh, but the smarter students will, will go straight into something much more substantially theoretical uh, and uh, uh, interesting. And, you know, this idea of upvoting, which again is kind of gamified, I, I'm absolutely with you. I'm not going to help the machine help them to just do all this kind of, um, you know, button hitting. Uh, uh, so mine was exclusively about the, the content uh, rather than that, you know, how many times you noticed your friend uh, and they'll all just get involved in, in random uh, gaming of that. So, so that, that was a well-made point. And, um, um, the other great thing about uh, uh, perusal is that students who are shy uh, to speak in a classroom situation, are much more likely to uh, contribute to a conversation uh, here. And that's great. Um, and of course, we then can pick out something that a Shire student has said the night before uh, and bring that up as a topic in the conversation that we uh, curate the following uh, day. You know? A funny thing is that I, I kind of found that sometimes students left, left I don't know if this is a, an Irish expression, but they left, left their best game on, on the pitch. In other words, that uh, you know, all their best moves came out the night before in the perusal conversation, and they kind of exhausted their imagination. Sometimes, sometimes when it came to the conversation the next day. Uh, sometimes when I would uh, say to a student, yeah, but you had this great idea last night. They were like, well, what was that? And they're kind of eight o'clock in the morning voices uh, compared to, they're all night owls, and they, they uh, had all these great ideas the night before. Um, uh, professor, I hate to interrupt. You have three minutes. Sure. Okay, super. Um, uh, I didn't get involved in the conversations. I tended to just leave them at it completely. Uh, I think that um, uh, they were less inhibited by that. And the conversation, because mine was already a discussion class, then I could go off in a wholly different direction uh, within that. Uh, so that was my thing on that. Uh, the scoring, I, I can talk about this again. I don't want to get bogged down on it now. But I allowed uh, them to have uh, too many free, free scores. So that at the end of it, those who had gamed the system pretty much got 100% for their perusal grade. Uh, uh, and I and whereas that meant that I had inflated scores at the end, I had a lot of really good discussions. So it was kind of win a bit, lose a bit uh, on that. I think there's probably better ways of doing that. Uh, simply then, you know, in terms of just little things at the end, I'm looking forward to next year. I hope to put in a video uh, uh, for annotation, which is something I didn't do this time around. Uh, PDF, uh, you can get a whole printout. I mean, you can keep it on the PDF. You don't have to print it out of your discussions. Uh, they used to include images uh, that my students did, but they don't anymore. Uh, so that's a little bit of a loss. I don't know why. Uh, and the only last thing I'd say is that I would get my students to uh, try and keep the window for when the uh, reading happens as tight as possible so that you get uh, kind of a lot of students are actually talking at the same time. And there's a backwards and forwards uh, rather than you've got a week to do this and you kind of get them randomly speaking to each other over the week. All right, that's uh, me done, uh, Walid. Uh, thanks to everybody for your attention. Oh, thank you very much, Professor. Like, um, um, I didn't know about you, but that like this is really insightful from 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 both of you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, now we should be opening the floor for um, for uh, questions from our audience. Um, so, if you if you if you have a question, you can go ahead and um, uh, turn on your microphone and ask one of our panelists. Uh, if you would like to come to the camera, um, raise up your hand and I will uh, turn you into a panelist so you, you can have camera access. You can go ahead. And um, if you don't have a question right, right away, I had a question in the chat, which I think was coming from Dr. Ahmed al -Aisa. And Dr. Ahmed al -Aisa was asking, um, about like some some tips that um, an instructor might use 
um, to, to make students read more. So um, if, you, um, if you have any tips for, for our students to read more, and if you're speaking, go ahead and turn on your microphone. Uh, I don't really have tips for them to, other than to use perusal. Uh, I, for me, this has been a real breakthrough uh, um, uh, to get them to actually read the text. I mean, I think the excitement of the social interaction uh, and the gamified aspect of it uh, has helped uh, hugely. Um, you know, that's, that's the, we're, we're broken records, all of us academics, about getting students to read, and they're like, oh my God, yawn. There he is talking about, you know, this generation doesn't read enough, you know. So, uh, but if you, if you gamify it and you give them a motivation, it helps. Uh, yeah. think, go ahead. I, I mean, I would just say, you know, John's right. I don't, I think perusal helps a lot. It, it's not, um, it's not a silver bullet, but it, it really does. Um, it helps to make it social, right? Because talking, um, you know, talking about what you're reading it, it helps people to solidify their knowledge. And so then it's, it's, um, it's not just a personal experience. I think, you know, John did a really good um, job uh, bringing that out in his talk, but I would say that's true for, for my students as well. Actually, this is the same point that I was actually pointing at is um, we probably bring the text to some familiar medium uh, to the students, a medium that they are um, really um, um, use every day. Okay, they have their um, their, their uh, phones and they are on social media every day. They are um, engaging in this, the, the 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 discussions and exchanging uh, ideas. So if we turn into if we turn that um, reading into uh, something that they that something really close to what they are doing every day, probably that might come as an encouragement for students to, uh, to, to read. For me, I still, I still uh, prefer the, uh, uh, like the physical book, although like I switched it lately to uh, uh, Kindle so I can carry like as many books I can in my bag, but uh, I, still, I still enjoy like having like that physical relationship with the, with the book. So. Um, yeah, and, and speaking to that, um... One of my faculty friends who also uses perusal, um, what she was doing is we, we posted some things that the library had access to, and we did get the copyright permissions to do so, so we put it on perusal, but she also included the links. The students could download the PDF. If they had a printer, they could print them out and read them that way. So, and she would put all those links in, in her syllabus. So you can, you can have it both ways sometimes. Uh, that's a really good idea, Ver Veronica. I just want to come back to uh, another issue. I mean, you know, how do we get students to read? Reading difficult texts is difficult, you know? And, and I think one of the things that we have to think about is, and I'm sure there's pedagogy on this, and I'm sure that psychologists have a lot to say about it. Um, but but for me, it's I, I, I try and remember what, because I continue to struggle with academic texts, um, you know, uh, not that I don't enjoy the process, but it's always a challenge. And, and to try and work out what the psychology, what is the resistance? Because the resistance is based on something very real. Is that, is that the sense of insecurity you have when, when you're presented with texts that just, and of course, these are mostly second language students that we have. So I think if we want to encourage our students to read, we must take seriously the difficulty of reading and not to be kind of patronizing about it as that it's just like some random thing that they don't do because of their cultural, because of their generation, you know, that kind of generational argument. Yeah, and so there's one thing that I do in my course that I think is different to maybe what John would do in a 400 level course. So in a 200 level course, I find that students um, struggle to understand the basic vocabulary of the textbook. Like these are political science terminology. So I actually have them do the perusal reading at, at the same time or after I've done the lecture. So I've actually explained to them what the words mean in the lecture and then they go and do the reading because otherwise they don't have a hook to hang their knowledge on in a 200 level entry level class, right? Because that, that, that has to do, I think, with if you're totally lost, you're just gonna disengage, right? But if you're like, okay, yes, professor has told me what this concept means, I can then go to the book and go into it more deeper. So I think that's, uh, uh, you know, again, approaching it as someone who actually might be seeing the material for the first time, well, what would you want? <laughs> well, you would want a guide first and then going into the reading 
anyway, but I think that works at the 200 level. Excellent. I have a question for both of you, like uh, those who um, use per, per, per Brussels in their teaching. All right. Uh, when you introduce Brussels for the first time for the students, okay, I would like to, to see how the students reacted, uh, uh, especially that uh, we know that some of the students will actually hate the reading, and many of them will go by through the semester without doing any of the reading or doing like the least am am amount of reading. So do you have any experience like dealing with the students who probably came to you and, uh, uh, and spoke about this and uh, why we are required to do that? We did not do that before things like that do you have any experience with like student resistance uh, uh, um i thought bethany you were going to come in um yeah like i've tons of experience of resistance they've resisted all the way along but again you know they had no choice but to do it here and i have to say i think that they oh they'll always tell me if they think it's a rubbish reading or if they think that it was too difficult or it was you know if they were against it there's, there's no problem articulating that but the, the 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 resistance to reading itself i mean it was just universal uptake because it's there's points to it and, and you know they're like here they you know they want their grade they'll do it you know so it's a graded activity whereas the drop quiz in the past was always much more um you know hit and miss you know because you're always going to gamble uh oh, well there won't be a quiz tomorrow and uh you know i won't do it or you know yeah, I mean, I, I also had a bit of resistance, I think, at first, right, because it's something new. And I think because it was introduced, like, with online learning, so it was, oh, it's another new thing. And I am insecure about the amount of new things happening in my world. Um, and so I think that's where, um, when you're, when they're being a bit resistant, you just, you try and enter that space, or I would at first in the first couple of weeks and be like, okay, let me show you what a, con you know, what a comment looks like. Let me do an at for you. So at student having trouble, look, it's it's going to be okay. Um, so there's a lot of just helping them, I think, to use the technology and feel okay in the technology. And, uh, but ultimately, this is, you know, you'd be a bit authoritarian in that, like, this is what we're doing, right? <laughs> it's been decided. I'm sorry. It's been decided. But I usually find that they, they, uh, they warm up to it, right, throughout the semester. Uh, just really quickly, one thing that hasn't been addressed uh, by anybody, and I'm just thinking about it now, is that it does involve quite a lot of uh, of um, front load and work for us as professors, and we, we had to learn how to use the system. Uh, one, and you know, your uh, you know, there's there's a lot. Of, certainly, Bethany, you know, you you describe quite a lot of involvement all the way through. Um, the, the other side of it, though, is that you're not grading, so that's the maybe the payoff. All right, uh, that's 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 really great. We have um, two more questions from um, uh, Professor Ahmed Laysa, and I think um, we should give him the floor to ask these questions on the mic uh, because um, the first question I didn't really get um, uh, what like I don't know how to answer that. Do you have a data from which high school students had to to uh, read? So probably Dr. Ahmed can come to the microphone and uh, let us hear more about that. You can go ahead and um, turn on your microphone. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry for correction for you. This is Isa from Student Affairs. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no problem. My question is, do we, do we have any data to know which student uh, like to read from the high school for first year when the first year uh, student? Do you have that experience from when you get these uh, courses for these doctors? Do we have that? We know which, which school they enforce because reading is not coming from beginning of the university. It's coming from the high school or primary school or middle school. Do you have this data or information? Well, the simple answer for me is I don't have that data, no. I, I mean, I think that that's something that maybe somebody who was studying pedagogy uh, closer or the psychology of education might want to gather. Uh, but I haven't had that experience. Yeah, but it, oh, it will oh, help. It no, 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 I understand. Right? So I see you. So your point is we should get that, I think, rather than do we have it? No, the answer to, to your first question is no. Should we get it? Perhaps. I, I would still point to the fact, though, that we don't acknowledge the difficulty of reading, that, we, that that's what we, what we really need to explore is, is what, you know, uh, the psychology of reading comprehension itself. 
Right. So yes. and my, my answer to that is also, no, we don't have that data, but there is something that I do with my students when I see them struggling. And that's that I <laughs> creep back on, on them and their grades from past classes. And I see if they've come to us from the bridge program or from, uh, you, you know, some of these university prep classes where they came out of high school a bit behind Then I'm thinking, okay, they're still, they're still going to need a little bit of watching over at the 200 level. Right. So I, I use that information just to identify students that are going to need some some extra help. So again, I don't know what high school they came from, but I can see what they've taken at AUS and if they've needed help at AUS um, and what their kind of what their transcript has said about their reading level and their academic performance level. And so that does help me just to, again, and identify students that may be strugglers um, and, and that, okay, maybe language is a problem for them. So let's encourage more, right? Well, it's not systematic, but it is something that I think it is involved with just kind of being a good teacher, if you can. I think it's not only students who are uh, not reading, like all of us, I think, like, like with a varying um, uh, uh, con 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 conditions okay like it's like this uh, focus from the media and from the technology about like giving up um, giving up uh, or giving us um, uh, snippets of information in small capsules like that made us uh, um, think that we can go by by, by not reading large texts and that's a, a enough and um, when um, coming to that's enough I think um, we came to actually three minutes over our uh, scheduled time. I would like to thank everyone um, who honored us today by attending this sem seminar. And um, in the uh, in the chat, if you can go just go up a little bit in the chat, you can see that I've um, uh, pasted a um, URL uh, where um, if you click on that URL, you can get uh, to view copies of today's um, uh, slides. I don't have Joan's slides yet, but um, I'll go ahead and check with them. Probably you will send me him, and I will um, um, share them through the same uh, through the same U URL. The URL will give you copies of all the uh, of the slides. Again, thank you very much. And Just one second, um, go ahead. I, have, I have a quick question to the panelists. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, hi. <laughs> I just came in late. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't know what I miss, but so far it's been a very rich discussion. But I have a quick question. So we talk about um, encouraging students to read. And what about encouraging faculty members to start using something like perusal? Because we, we, we receive quite a lot of um, questions from faculty members who are interested, but they are so scared to even start using perusal. So what is your advice in terms of, you know, when you start using it, how easy it is? Because for me, it is easy, but again, I mean, it has to come from other people. So what do you think? What, what, what would you suggest to your colleague? Uh, I would think, so John pointed out that it's kind of uh, front loaded, right? So that there's a bit of setup, right? I think just a lot of support from maybe other people in their department or in their college to walk them through setting it up and, and getting those assignments going. And I know the library also is doing a great job, right? But um, uptake, uh, I think has to be from like, okay, here's how it looks, you know, in my course. And so then it's not so scary, but like actually, like having someone maybe that they can email within their their department or something because I felt like I didn't know what I was doing. I was like, it's not working and I'm emailing my <laughs> other people that I know have used it. And I'm like, it's still not working. Um, <laughs> so I think just, just having a lot of support at the beginning um, it's someone to talk through as well. So I was very fortunate because, you know, my course is team taught. So we have the three of us like deciding how to, to, to use it. And so we have a, a support system in that. Um, to decide like, okay, are we going to have annotations? Are we not going to have annotations? But I think, yeah, just because those kind of um, decisions have to be talked through. And so um, professors feel better when I think there's a space um, for, for that. But anyway. And something Joan said at the beginning that um, um, he got um, all the help that he required from the library and from and from us, and um, I think that help will continue to, uh, to 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 cover everyone who's asking for it. So please, if you have any questions about how to use Perusal, go ahead and um, get get in touch with the, with the, us, um, uh, Veronique, and the um, uh, the rest of the librarians will also be able to help. 
And um, if you um, if you feel that you are facing issues, come and talk to us, and we'll. I'm, I'm sure that we can we can we can get all these issues out of the way. All right, excellent. So um, unless um, anyone else has um, a question or a comment, I have uh, one question for the doctor. Two doctors. All right. Yeah. Do you do you they they visit the the Beit al near outside the off campus? I, I sorry, you just broke up. I said. I think as... um, his question was: um, Anyone visited uh, uh, the House of Wisdom, which is just outside of campus? That was your yes. question. Yeah, yes, right. I've, I've been there multiple times. It's fabulous, except nobody wears a mask, so I go in for five minutes and then I run. Um, but otherwise, uh, I, I often regularly see my own students there. So uh, I mean, I, not not on purpose. Like I must uh, add. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Thank Aisha. you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. I was thinking about that myself and it just slipped out of my mind. Thank you very much for, for, for reminding us. And um, thank you again for everyone and hope to see you again soon and enjoy the um, uh, spring break for everyone. Hope, hopefully that you will get a restful um, time. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, doctor. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you, you Wally, for setting this up. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bethany. Thank you, Veronique. Bye. Thank you.